Good evening and thank you for joining us. After 15 years of planning, fundraising, and numerous delays, the Thunder Bay Cyclotron is finally delivering medical isotopes to the regional hospital. The $10 million project was completed in 2015, but then took another six years to get everything in place for final approval from Health Canada. Jonathan Wilson has the latest details. It's a long-awaited announcement from the Regional Hospital and the Regional Research Institute as locally produced radioactive isotopes are now being sent to the local cancer centre for diagnosing oncology patients. The first isotopes were actually delivered five months ago, but hospital officials held off until now to share the news. We actually started delivering isotopes just to make sure the processes were in place so we have a courier, so we can't just walk it across the parking lot, it's not allowed, you need a courier, so we have a courier, we started that on October 20th and would do runs and then for the first month, so it was early November, I can't remember if it was November 1st or 2nd that we actually used the isotopes from uh, the cyclotron here in Thunder Bay and use those on patients here. Manager of Diagnostic Imaging Sandra Wilson says cancer patients who come to the hospital from around the region can now be confident their appointments won't be cancelled due to issues with isotope shipments from southern Ontario. We were dependent on it coming from Toronto or Hamilton prior to that. So we were reliant on uh, flights and couriers, which always depended on weather and access and roads and so on. Having it here means it's far more reliable. Even in the midst of a snowstorm on Tuesday, the stuff got here uh, right on time. The Cyclotron project was first proposed in 2007 and received millions of dollars in funding from Ottawa, the province, the city and local donors. The massive unit was installed in 2015 and produced its first isotopes the following year. But since then, it's only been used for cancer research projects as it didn't meet all the Health Canada requirements for cancer isotopes until late last year. Yeah, no, absolutely frust frustrating for sure. I think there's a, a number of things that happened. We had some staff turnover, uh, some senior leaders of the cyclotron itself. So it's not all, you know, us just saying Health Canada was holding us up. We had to get uh, the work done here at this end as well. So frustrating, but we had to make sure we did it right. We would never, ever sacrifice, you know, patient safety to make sure that we got this to the finish line quick. We have wanted to get to the finish line correctly. Wilson says the local breakthrough will lead to quicker cancer diagnosis and better outcomes for patients as the local cyclotron will not only be more reliable for isotopes, but will also produce more of them for local use each day. Because it has such a short half-life, we can only get enough to do between five and six patients. Now, again, since it's a, around the corner, we can do up to nine patients a day, and I believe that we're going to be able to get up to 10, which means we've basically doubled the number of patients that we're able to service in any given day. Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. The emergency department in Red Lake will be closed for 24 hours this weekend due to a shortage of physicians. The ER will be unavailable from 8 a.m. Saturday until 8 a.m. Sunday. The closest emergency department is just over 200 kilometers away in Dryden. Hospital officials in Red Lake say people there should still call 911 for medical emergencies, but they suggest traveling to Dryden or calling telehealth for less urgent problems. Kiwetanung NDP member Saul Mamakwa is calling on the province to immediately send resources to the hospital so the ER can remain open. The Thunder Bay Health Coalition is gearing up for a fight against what it calls unprecedented health care privatization by the Ford government. The organization held a virtual summit yesterday evening to discuss the issue. Lee Noonan has more. So I see what's happened in, in privatized, privatized health care, and it's bad enough in home care and long-term care, but sure as hell don't need it in our hospitals. Speakers from local and provincial organizations discussed Ontario's already low levels of funding for public services and their concerns with the impact increased privatization could have. $30 billion is a huge amount of money, but that's how far we are behind the other provinces. That's how much we would have to spend more just to be average. And in the pandemic, we were being contacted because there were not enough professionals in your hospital. And if, you know, they continue down this road and the private clinics poach your professionals, you won't be able to replace them. It will mean like lower quality health care for the North when you already have suffered enough under, you know, successive governments that have ignored Northern Ontario. Just over two dozen Thunder Bay residents attended, mostly coalition members and healthcare professionals. Many say they underwent major surgeries and fear they may not have been able to afford the same level of care under a private system. I'm 60 years old and I have an 80-year-old mother and long-term care concerns me and 
and access to health care concerns me. And in the North, it's getting worse instead of better. I'm concerned about the direction of this government, and I'm concerned that they're trying to take us down a road that will benefit corporations, but it will not benefit me or anybody that I know or care about. Similar events are being hosted throughout the province as the Ontario Health Coalition prepares to launch a public awareness campaign going into the provincial election. Local organizers will be distributing signs throughout the region. Lee Noonan, TBT News. As COVID-19 hospitalizations rise in Ontario, the Premier faced questions today over whether the province reopened too quickly. Doug Ford says he doesn't think so. I've been accused of being the most cautious leader in, the, in the North America. And when everyone else in the whole country is taking their masks off and we're the last province to do so, I, I think one more PEI. Um, but I'll always, I'll always be the cautious one. Ford spoke in Ottawa where the city's wastewater shows an increase in the COVID-19 viral signal. Ford says he has confidence that the health care system will be able to handle a spike in cases. He was in the capital to announce a $29 million investment to expand the Ottawa Hospital's civic campus. Well, turning to the local COVID-19 situation now, the health unit says the outbreak at the Thunder Bay Correctional Centre is now over. Meanwhile, there's one fewer COVID patient at the Regional Health Sciences Centre today. There are 27 COVID-19 patients at the Regional Hospital, with five in the ICU. The hospital's occupancy rate sits just below 100%, while the occupancy rate in intensive care is now at 72%. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting 54 new cases since Wednesday, and there are now 121 known active cases, though this is believed to be an underrepresentation. The Northwestern Health Unit is reporting 267 active cases in its catchment area. 212 of those come from reserves in the Sioux Lookout area. The NWHU's test positivity rate has slipped to 15.9%. Thunder Bay Police have rescued a female victim and arrested three suspects in an alleged kidnapping case. Local officers got a tip from Toronto Police about a female being held against her will here in Thunder Bay. City Police conducted a traffic stop early this morning and located the victim and the suspects. A 55-year-old man from Thunder Bay, a 22-year-old from Toronto, and a 19-year-old from Ottawa are all in custody, charged with forcible confinement and uttering death threats. Some local high school and university students took part in a Fridays for Future climate strike today as part of a worldwide campaign. Those who gathered outside Minister Patty Haiju's office hope to make climate change top of mind in Thunder Bay. Vasilios Bellos reports. More than 70 students from Superior Collegiate and Lakehead University attended the climate strike at MP Patty Haidu's office, all there hoping to shift the local attitude surrounding climate change. It was part of a global day of climate action called Fridays for Future, founded in 2018. The students from Superior quickly made their voices heard after arriving, also flashing homemade signs to drivers passing down Red River Road. Angelina Pathak was one of the students involved and believes more needs to be done to battle climate change, hoping demonstrations like this one can help. It's our future and the climate, I don't, I mean, I feel like government offices, they usually say a lot about what they're doing and that, but you don't really see a lot of action being put into place. So we wanted to advocate on behalf of everybody who couldn't and everybody in our, like for our youth and people younger than us and people older than us, so we could live in a habitable planet. A statement issued by Haidu stressed the Liberal government is currently taking historic steps regarding climate action. And she adds that it's inspiring to see the movement led by youth. While climate change is recognized as an issue that will have a greater impact on the younger generation, Tin Chi Lu from Superior Collegiate believes it is something that needs to be addressed by people of all ages. Climate change as an issue is something that affects all of us and something that we're all in together. It Ultimately, it is going to be the younger generations that kind of have to clean up the climate crisis that we're in right now. But I do think everyone has to work together to achieve this. The students from LU that attended spent the hours before the demonstration also making signs, many of them stressing that the issue is crucial now and not something to be addressed down the road. Molly Nolly Castaneda is a Lakehead student who has considered herself an advocate for the environment since she was 12 and had a message for everyone with a passion for stopping climate change. You need to remember that you're not alone. 
where a lot of people who care for the for this earth, for this nature, for everyone living on it, and all the generations to come, and we will will keep fighting. Today's demonstration in Thunder Bay is just a small part of a much bigger campaign, with local activists here believing that every action can make a difference. Vasilios Bellows, TVT News. The walleye population in Lake of the Woods has been monitored since 1979. The Big Lake is both an interprovincial and an international body of water, which supports dozens of commercial and residential fishery businesses. But walleye numbers have been dropping over the years. As a result, the province has launched a series of public meetings on the situation. Adam Riley has more. Officials who monitor walleye numbers on Lake of the Woods say they have narrowed down what they believe to be the cause of a population decline in the species. The harvest in the recreational fishery is high enough on its own through our monitoring data to be a cause for concern and require discussion. We note that the majority of the observed walleye mortality, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about mortality, which is a death rate, can be directly attributed to our recreational harvest. Gathering the data of both the biomass and the mortality of walleye in the lake from surveys conducted pre-pandemic, researchers have placed the walleye population of Lake of the Woods in the category of overfished and experiencing overfishing. And the lake sits alone from two other comparative lakes in the region, Lac Sewell and Rainy Lake. The biomass of the Lake of the Woods walleye stock is lower than the amount we'd expect to see for a healthy lake. And this threshold is called the fisheries reference point. Mortality is higher than we'd expect for a healthy stock. We also observe a lower number of old big fish uh, when compared to large recreational walleye fisheries, such as Rainy Lake. As a result of the findings, an advisory council made up of representatives from the area has put forth a proposal that will see changes in the limits for Lake of the Woods. All anglers on Lake of the Woods will be treated with the same set of regulations and that they would have this di differential limit between what they can catch in one day and what they can possess. The information session ended with a question and answer period for members of the public, allowing officials to answer questions not covered by the presentations or to elaborate on their findings. Another virtual session is scheduled for the evening of March 29th. However, there is hope for in-person sessions later this spring and summer. Adam Riley, TBT News. A local man, Wade Durham, is nearly a quarter million dollars richer today after winning this month's Thunder Bay 50-50 draw in support of the Regional Health Sciences Foundation. He got the faithful call from CEO Glenn Craig earlier today. How are you doing today? I'm well, Glenn. How are you? Oh, well, not bad. I think I can make your day a little bit better. No way. <laughs> what would you say if I told you you've just won $731,215? Oh my god, are you serious? I'm deadly serious. Oh my god. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. I would say you're absolutely right in making my day. And my apologies, he won near to three quarters of a million dollars. And Durham says on the last Friday of every month, he's told his wife, today is the day. Well, that day has finally arrived. He says he'll use the money to pay for school for his kids and to pay off some bills. Next month's grand prize has already exceeded $11,000 in just a few hours. That draw will take place on April 29th. Well, that is not a bad way to start.